Welcome to Bible Hour live stream, and we're in the midst of a study called Power for Today, and uh, thank God for what he's doing, and uh, it's been a great blessing. We're going to be turning to Acts chapter 4, and uh, we're going to continue in this, praise the Lord, and Before we do that, I just want to field some of these questions. I really do appreciate these questions. Many of them are very thoughtful, and um, we're going to uh, take a look at these and uh, see how we go. One question was, how come even though I've been saved a while, I don't find it easy to speak in tongues? Well, the answer to that is I'm not sure. Um... The question implies that this person can and does speak in tongues. But why would they struggle or why would they find it not easy to do that? So I I think the answer is simply that different people struggle with different things. Um, Some people struggle to just pray. They They struggle in their faith. They struggle with praying out loud to an invisible God. There's other people that they struggle more perhaps with reading the Bible and just, um, you know, uh, that's just something that doesn't come natural to them. So you have to just understand that, um, that uh, the fact that you struggle with something certainly doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. There's people that come from different religious backgrounds and when they come to church, they're not familiar with um, singing or worship. You know, they're used to church being quiet, and and so the reference points are different. There's people that often struggle with sharing their faith. Um, You know, there's practical things people struggle with. There's plenty of people that struggle with getting up early and going to work. Um, There's people that struggle with relationships because they have issues in their personality that aren't worked out. There's people that struggle with overeating. So the point is that When something is worth doing, it's worth overcoming the fact that it's not easy for you. Let me say that again. If something's worth doing, it's worth contending against your struggle to do it. Um, Some people may need a spiritual breakthrough in some area of their life. But we do know that every Christian has these dynamics. The flesh wars against the spirit. So there's something in our flesh that resists spiritual things that has to be overcome. Uh, The Bible tells us to build up our faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. And so this is something you are doing as an act of your will. When you exercise physically, that doesn't always come easily. Amen. That's always not something you feel like doing, but you do it to build up your physical body. And the Bible says that Speaking in tongues has this dynamic of building our faith. And so we should do that. And um, I believe that the answer to this individual would be that God's given this to you as a great gift. And it's worth contending with whatever resistances there may be. And you'll find a breakthrough. You'll find a great blessing. Um, The root of the word disciple would be discipline. So that means a disciple in Christ is somebody who is deciding to do in their flesh what may not become, be, be natural at first. And I know there was many things about the Christian life that didn't come easy for me when I first got saved. I was converted, I was filled with the Holy Ghost, but there were things I had to work at. So that's a good question. Uh, number two. When praying for someone like on the street or in your workplace for healing, does the prayer have to be specific to their root cause, for instance, forgiveness, bitterness, etc.? Or can it be a basic prayer in faith? The answer to that is no. It does not have to be specific to their root cause. And the truth is... um, the setting that you're in may not always lend itself to that. So the idea of getting to the root cause of a sickness would be, in the scriptures, one of the many different 
methods, we could say, of praying for the sick. So the scripture doesn't have just one rote formula for praying for the sick. We function on a, a fundamental premise, and that is that God did not intend human beings to get sick in the original design, that it was sin that opened the door to death and sickness and disease and sin. And when Christ came to be the sacrifice for our sin, that was for both the wholeness that comes through being forgiven as well as the wholeness that comes from being healed. And that's, that's a concept in, in all through the Bible that redemption involves mind, body, and spirit. So in the Bible, there are different methods of people getting healed, if you think about it. There are people that touched Jesus and were healed. One woman touched the hem of his garment and she was healed because in her faith, she said, if I could just but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be healed. There's other places where Jesus touched them and they were healed. There were times when Jesus spoke the word only and the centurion's servant was healed, and he spoke the word, and the woman, you know, bowed over with her back problem for years, was healed. There was one place where Jesus made some clay out of, made some, I'm sorry, one, there was one place where Jesus made some clay out of dirt and his spit. The Bible says that. He spit in the dirt, made some clay, and put it on somebody's eyes. So you're going to have to do something with that in your theology. But the Bible gives us direction. It says, these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Uh, Peter, he diagnosed that uh, part of a man's problem was the gall of bitterness. And this was causing him to come to wrong conclusions doctrinally. And, and the Bible talks about the root of bitterness springing up, troubling us. And, and it, it implies lame feet being turned out of the way. And so there's, there's that, um, that dynamic in the Bible as well. But um, there's another place where, G, where Peter simply grabbed a man by his hand and lifted him up, and he was healed. Uh, there's another place where Peter's shadow healed people. And that was, you know, people's faith being so accelerated that they felt if Peter's shadow fell upon us, the grace of God would touch us and they were healed. Another place, they took um, handkerchiefs from Paul and he prayed over them and then they took them to sick and demon-possessed people and they were healed. So um, it, it's quite, it's quite a, um, a broad topic. My own um, experience with praying for the sick is many. It's multiple. I, I laid hands on a man in our parking lot who was a visitor to one of our outreaches, one of the city councilmen. He told me he had cancer. I asked if I could pray for him. I didn't interview him. I just asked him if I could pray for his cancer. And I laid hands on him, and I commanded the cancer to leave in the name of Jesus Christ, and he was healed. And to this day is completely cancer-free, was very serious at that time, and he attributes his healing to that prayer. Um, and uh, there's other places where um, I've done mass prayers, where there'd be people at an altar, and I tell them to put their hand on their body, and they pray themselves. But there's been many times that I have led people through a prayers of forgiveness for the people that have hurt them or breaking the curse and also with great results. So the, the, the simple answer is that no, you don't have to always get to the specific root cause because there's many ways that God heals through people's faith. It's not a formula. It's not a set of magic words. It's not an incantation. It's faith connected to the promises of God, and God honors that. Not only that, but human beings have a dimension of authority. 
We were created in the image of God and our words have authority, especially people that are saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, quoting God's word and in the authority of God's commission. Um, so you can take authority. Is there a simple prayer you would recommend? Yes, I would say, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he, it will be done for you. That's, that's the basic beginning template. But you can read that we can plead the blood of Jesus. We can invoke the power of the Holy Spirit. We can ourselves take authority and command. We can quote the word of God. By his stripes we were healed and lay claim to that as we, uh, as we believe God. We can appeal to God to touch someone with his healing power. So, again, we can ask God. Prayer is talking to God. Prayer is commanding the devil. You can command the devil. And even we see evidence in Scripture where Jesus rebuked the fever. He spoke to the sickness and commanded it to leave. I believe it was um, Peter's wife's mother is what, uh, what I believe that was happening there. So... Here's what you have to understand about medicine and about healing in the human body. One of the most honest doctors I ever went to was an Indian man who was in Nairobi, Kenya. He was not a Christian. And he got to talking to me and I was asking some questions and he said, listen, he said, we as doctors don't heal anybody, God heals. And he said, what I mean by that is God has put healing in the human body. We know bodies should be healed because there are things in the human body. We simply are helping with the creative God to find a pathway to people getting better. That was, this is a secular man. Of course, he might have a religious background, but this guy, he, he wasn't invoking his religion and I believe in doctors, and I appreciate medical doctors, but let's just be honest. They're, they call them practicing physicians for a reason, because they're practicing on us. And one doctor, I believe this is a secular doctor, uh, he said healing is more art than science. So you just take that for what it's worth. We appreciate hospitals and doctors. They don't know everything, and they should admit that. The truth is, they still don't have any idea why aspirin works. You can check that out yourself. So you have to realize that this isn't some pat formula, but this is a spiritual dimension that we as Christians are encouraged to, and, and we, we, we take God at his word, and I believe Jesus at one point says, I do cures. I do cures. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? So our job is to uh, take the promises of God and believe God that God wants to heal people and thank God people do get healed. And then one last question somebody asked, is it possible for people who are not baptized in the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues to pray for people to be healed? And the answer is yes, of course. Yes, of course. So why? Why is that? Because God is kind and God answers prayer. And there are many promises of healing that are not connected to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The person didn't ask this, but I can follow the logical train. Then why the Holy Spirit? Well, because it's a promise of power. It's an upgrade. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The disciples of Christ were involved in miracle healing uh, before they were baptized in the Holy Ghost, but they got an upgrade. And uh, this, is, this is a definite, definite scriptural uh, instruction to get filled with the Holy Spirit. But then I'll give you this uh, to think about. It's a great indicator that the ministries that you see emphasizing healing and the supernatural are Pentecostal. And there's a reason for that. 
because when you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, there is a boldness, there is a, a uh, emphasis and an anointing to that that other Christians that no doubt can believe God and do believe God, they don't have that same uh, energetic devotion to it because they're, they're leaving something out. So there's, there's the answer that yes, uh, many of these ministries that are Christian and pray, they often are of, of the, if it's your will, you know, heal this person camp. Whereas Pentecostals have a confidence and the ministries that you see emphasize this are Holy Ghost filled, tongue talking Christians that are believing God. Very good, good questions. So let's move on with our study. Acts uh, chapter four, we're gonna look at this issue of the need for refilling, the need for refilling. And so let's read Acts chapter 4, 29 through 31. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. All right, so let's take a look at the concerns that people have about this. There are people who say that once you are filled with the Spirit, that can never be lost. So then, again, uh, as, many, uh, as often as the case, especially with Calvinist type thinking, it's based on human reasoning rather than scripture. And we have to go to the word of God. So the human reasoning that you'll hear people um, spout is the Holy Spirit is in you, you can't leak a person. That's, that's a good one. The Holy Spirit isn't liquid. Okay, so again, that, that is just simply, you know, the, the, the human brain trying to make sense of something. But let's take a look at what the Bible says. The Bible talks about receiving power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So there, there's not so much this thought of losing the person as it is losing the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and you're going to find that that is not only logical, it's very scriptural. In our text, these people in Acts chapter 4 were already baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. So this, this is a real story. So we can understand the nature of being filled and those who are being filled. So what happened in the context is that they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They began to preach. They began to a minister, and this involved miracles and supernatural dimensions. Um, we understand the story about the healing of the lame man at the temple gate, and this is what preceded this prayer. So I'm going to read that. Acts chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. This, there's a man that gets healed. And uh, it's, it brings a great upheaval. The Pharisees are, are annoyed at this. And it says in verse 16, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle that has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. But so it spreads no further among the people. Let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus Christ. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. So they get some pushback. And as happens when there's pushback is that there's, there's an emotional response that you can often get on your back foot and go, whoa, 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 maybe, maybe we shouldn't be doing this, but the leaders knew this is bad. They did not want to lose this. So they go back to the, to the, to the place of prayer. 
They cry out to God. God, you see their threatenings. You see the pushback. You see. And they said, look on their threats and grant to your servants, this is verse 29, with all boldness that they may speak your word, stretching out your hand to heal and signs and wonders. And when they prayed, the place they were assembled was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke the word of God with boldness. So that's the scripture. So you can lay aside that you, you can't leak a, a person and the Holy Spirit's not liquid because that's just somebody's pea brain overworking. The Bible says what it says. These people were filled with the Holy Ghost. They were involved in supernatural ministry. They got pushed back. They were a little bit freaked out. They went back to the prayer room. They said, God, do it again. God, do that again. Because where there is fear of proclaiming the gospel and where there is fear or a hesitation to function in healing, there is a lack of Holy Spirit power. And that explains most of the churches in the Western world today. How many churches do you see on the streets evangelizing? How many churches do you see advertising miracles and contending? It's not because they're not Christians. It's because they have X'd this out of their doctrinal belief system. And that's, that's sub-scriptural Christianity at, at best. That's the kindest way you could put it. So they were concerned that there was going to be a lack of power demonstrated. The persecution came because of a miracle. See, so put this together. This isn't rocket science. The reason why a lot of Christians have lost the dynamic of the Holy Spirit is because they don't like the pushback that comes. They simply just don't like the pushback. So it's like, let's just find a comfortable niche where we can believe what we believe and go to church and sing our songs and uh, just, you know, kind of get along and not have anybody say weird things about us. But the early Christians said, no way. No, that's not what we're called to do. We don't deliberately ruffle feathers and we're not trying to upset the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but we care about people enough to obey God and preach his word. And if we're going to obey God and preach his word, we need the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, the authorities feared the demonstration of power through healing. They knew that it drew people. They knew it validates the message. They knew it confirmed the messengers. You notice in Acts chapter 4, they were not demanding that they do not believe in Jesus. They just didn't want the power to be shown. Let's read Acts 4.21. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. It's interesting that when Reinhard Bonnke was allowed to preach in Khartoum, Sudan. The authorities said, that's fine. You can come, you can set up, you can preach, but you are not allowed to pray for the sick. Gee, I wonder why. How interesting. Some people think that miracles are optional, but the apostles felt they were essential. They were essential to the Great Commission. They were essential to what the Holy Spirit's purpose was when it was poured out. Acts 4, verse 30. By stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. So this is what they were contending for. They were contending for the demonstration of the Holy Spirit power, especially as it was in context of miracle healing and deliverance. So that is the scriptural dynamic that we are filled with the Holy Spirit 
and we are to be refilled with the Holy Spirit. Another um, dynamic is the nature of the vessel. The vessels that the Holy Spirit fills with his power are people. Imagine that. People like you and I. And the nature of people is we are like leaky vessels. Our emotions are, are quite fragile. I know that a lot of people don't want to admit that. We think, well, I'm a logical creature, but most of us are emotional creatures. And they're very tenuous, very, very fragile in many ways. But even spiritually, the Bible declares very clearly that spiritual power can be depleted and drain away. That doesn't mean that we're less saved than we were you know, the day before. It just means that spiritual power is a real dimension. It's not a, it's not a concept. So we know this biblically, Acts 4.31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So again, they had already been filled in Acts chapter 2. Why did they need to be filled again? Well, because there was a need. There was a need. It wasn't like, you know, God only gave them 10 bucks worth the first time, and then he said, fill her up the next time. They were filled with the Holy Spirit both times. So that implies that you can be filled, but you need to stay filled. We uh, looked at Ephesians 5.18 earlier uh, in our study, but let's look at it again. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So in the uh, original Greek, you'll see, if you look that up, that this involves what's known as the continuous tense. So he's, he's making a very obvious comparison here. You know, drunks, they don't just get drunk once and then tick that box and say, been there, done that. This is something they do over and over and over again. The Bible likens the baptism of the Holy Spirit in many ways. It's, it brings a comparison. These are not drunk as you suppose, but they are filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Right? And the reason this is, is, and this is an aside, is I believe that when people get drunk, it's because they're empty and they want to be filled with something that is intoxicating. And what they're really after is the Holy Spirit. They just don't know it. In other words, as human beings separated from God, we, are, we just feel parched and empty and we need something. And when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, it was like, wow. Wow, I don't, I don't need to do drugs anymore. I don't need alcohol anymore. As a matter of fact, I think this is what I was looking for when I was bored and I was empty and hollow. And not unlike the reality of being a proper drunk, <laughs> a proper Pentecostal is filled and refilled and refilled. Okay, so we have service here at church twice today, and we're going to get filled with God. This is the Lord's day. This is the day we set aside other things, and we focus on eternal things, and we, we refill the wells in, in a way that we can't do other ways. And, and uh, then, you know, by Monday, Tuesday, by Wednesday, man, I need a top up. I need to come back, and I, I want that same refilling, and thank God we're going to be able to come back to church and assemble together, which is the way God designed it. It meets a need. There's something very real there. And, and you, can, you can even feel depleted. Uh, there's many people, we're longing to get back to the assembly because there is a dynamic in assembling. Thank God for the live stream. Thank God that we can pray anywhere. But you have to admit, there's something better about coming together. There's something better about the Ecclesia because it just like refills us and reorients us again. So this is just a very natural, very logical, very scriptural understanding. Don't be a proper drunk and get drunk all the time, which is going to ruin you. But be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Keep being filled. And... 
this is, uh, this is very, very, very obvious to anybody that's um, lived long and, and, and been filled with the Holy Ghost. We can feel a lack of power. We can feel a draining of dynamic in our lives and in our ministries that needs to be replenished. So what kinds of things cause the depletion of the spiritual power? Let's look scripturally. Ministry. Ministry is by definition the giving out of something. You are, you are serving, but you are also dispensing something spiritual to people. Let's take a look at Luke 8, 46. But Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. That's pretty intense. Jesus said, I could feel the draw on my spiritual batteries. That's just, just, take it for what it's worth. He said, I could feel it. I felt the power has gone out. Now, you know, we can debate all we want about Jesus, whether he needed to be filled the way we do, and we're not gonna go there because we're not Jesus, <laughs> right? We need to be refilled because power goes out from us and we don't have an unlimited supply. But I might just throw in there that Jesus did spend all night in prayer quite often. And if Jesus got up early many hours before day to pray and commune with the Father, how much more are you and I? How much more are you and I? We, we have to view this as filling the well, filling the well with God's word, filling the well with prayer, speaking in tongues, building up our faith, building up our faith, because otherwise it is fallen down. So. This is very scriptural, very logical. When you give out spiritual power, it is possible to have less than before. Then we need to be refilled. Carnality, I believe, and disobedience can deplete spiritual power. Things we involve ourselves in. Things that we, lines that we cross, things that we look at. Let's take a look at 2 Peter 2, or 1 Peter 2.11. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. So we have this struggle. The, the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And, and when you make decisions for uh, righteousness, it's like you're building something. And when you make decisions for carnality, it's like you're losing something. And again, it's not a matter of you know, I'm less saved than I was. We're talking about strength. Be like garbage in, garbage out, man. You know, if all you do every day is eat Maltesers and drink Coke, you might get away with it, but someday it's going to come crashing in on you, man. Because garbage in, garbage out. You, you, you're going to be lacking some nutrients. You're going to be lacking some critical ingredients to health. That's no different than what you watch on YouTube and what you read and what you spend your time listening to and whether or not you can be bothered to exercise to godliness and have a diet of that which is wholesome in your life. Disobedience, sin, these are all things that can deplete us. Psalms 32 verse 4. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. So one translation says, my strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. So you have to keep watering those flowers if you want them to grow. You have to keep, you have to keep the field moist if you want there to be a harvest. You're not going to feel spiritually alive when you're disobedient. You're not going to feel dynamic when you're involved in sin. The troubles of life can deplete spiritual power. Psalms 138 verse 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies and your right hand will save me. So we have mental, physical exertion that's required in just dealing with troubles. There's self-reliance that can cause a depletion. 
we begin to lean on our own abilities. It's a dangerous tendency that when we're desperate, we cry out to God for, for help, and God helps us, but then when he does, we can all of a sudden stop looking for God. It's like, look, I got this now. Like, I, I got this. I've worked this out. I know how to do this. I know how to be married now, or I know how to raise kids or handle my finances, and I, I know how to do this now. And, and uh, we stop seeking God. We can stop spending time with God. Jeremiah 17, 5 through 6. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes his, uh, pardon me, flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. The parched places of the wilderness. And this is a picture of being depleted of the glory of God's spirit in our lives. So then let's quickly talk about being filled again. The good news is God does not want us to remain depleted and powerless. So let's read Ephesians 5.18 again. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. So he's talking to people that are already saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. We know they got filled with the Holy Spirit. He wouldn't tell them to be filled again and use that continuous tense, be being filled, if it were not necessary and if it were not possible. So how do we do that? Being re refilled will depend on a recognition that we knew we know we need it. In other words, in our text, the reason they got a refilling is they sensed the danger of it depleting from their lives. And they came back and they pleaded with God and took God at his word and he honored them. So if you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, the question is, what's changed in your life? Is there evidence of you being filled with a power that is not your own? There may need to be a humble inventory that says, you know what? I think I'm out of, out of petrol here, man. I think I'm low on oil. You better check the oil. If you don't check the oil, you could ruin the vehicle, man. And I remember when I uh, was a young convert, my friend gave me a car. And because he gave it to me, I didn't really look after it. And it wasn't running very well. And finally, one of the guys at work said, well, let's check the oil, and it was four liters low. That explains it. I learned a vital lesson there. You know, you might want to check the oil. How's the oil level, Christian? Because it's not automatic. You have to, you, this isn't a maintenance-free battery here, right? Remember the old batteries? You had to unscrew the little thing, put the the distilled water in there. I, I want a maintenance-free battery, personally. I don't want to be doing that. But our spiritual lives aren't maintenance-free batteries. You're going to have to hook up to the recharger, man. You're going to have to check the oil. It may involve repentance. Ephesians 4.30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. That means to offend or make him uncomfortable or grieved. So you can run God off. You can run him off. You can make it plain that he's not welcome. It may mean making room for God. You know, spending time. We have time for all kinds of things. We have time. How much time do you spend on the computer or on your phone? You're going to have to take time to refill and it comes by asking for a refilling. Luke eleven thirteen. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So this isn't a one-off. This is something that needs to be present and obvious in our lives. And that actually swerves into one of the questions that was on the, um, on the question system here and that is that you know it, how do you know if you ask for the Holy Spirit that the devil isn't going to slip something in you know 
Jesus answered that question right here. He said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. In other words, he said, if your child asked you for a piece of bread, are you going to give him a brick? No. And he said, if you being a sinner know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Is your heavenly father going to give you what you ask for? If you ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit, do you think God is going to stand by and let the devil elbow him out of the way and put a demon in there? No, because God is God. And we need to simply ask God. This is a humility. There's a humility that admits. Jesus said, happy are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. That's not talking about some wimpy, defeated, you know, morbid introspection thing. He's saying, happy are people that come to me and rehearse before me, God, I'm empty. In myself, I am bankrupt. I, I, there's no balance here, man. I'm in a deficit. I need you. I need something I do not have. And the Bible says, happy are people that realize that because to them, belongs the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 4.31, and we'll close right there. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So the power and the baptism and the filling of the Holy Spirit is intended not to be a one-off and not to just be for a prior generation. It's for every child of God that God loves, that we can be refilled and need to be being filled. Power for today. That's all for today. We're going to uh, dismiss right now from Bible Hour and we'll begin our service in a few minutes and pick this up next week. The Lord bless you.